So are you guys familiar with NYU and in the city, 14th Street? That was a club, Palladium, held 3,000 people. That club had a Friday night, they're doing 3,000, ringing. I go to them, I say, hey, can I play here? They said, you'll never play here. You used to play at that club home base. You're not bringing that nasty crowd into our club. I had the sales guy call him, call her, the lady. Mm -hmm. Well, I became very good friends, which is very nice. But at the time, they told me no. They didn't even ask how much I wanted. The salesperson, I said, tell him I'll come for free. They said, tell him he could come down. I said, what time can I play? Tell him 3.15. Nigga, the club's over for. <laughs> no problem. Give me that 3.15 slot. Okay, you want action? I'm going to give you action tonight. I, I remember the records to this day. I played 900 number, Wu-Tang, Protect Your Neck. I played uh, Run DMC, Peter Piper, lifted that motherfucker off the ground. Funk Flex. Please welcome. <laughs> this is good, man. This I know it's got a long time, man. Long time. Man. I mean, it, 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 long time, but it wasn't easy. Meet. It was a long time to get to meet this fella. Flex been rocking for a long time, so to get on this radar is a big thing. Flex, I can go all night with you, mm -hmm. and I Good almost time. don't know where to start. So I'm kind of going to start with some of your accolades. Okay, that's cool. And then we'll back it up. Oh. Tunnel. Oh, man, tunnel. We don't need to talk about it. We're going to get into you're it. Just, you're just prepping. You just here. Five albums. Five albums, yeah. Five albums. Car and Bike Show. Correct, yes. And I'm back. Inflexwetrust.com. Yes. Deals with Ford Motors mm -hmm. and Chevy Motors. Correct. And Chirac. Oh, we getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to leave it. Leave Deal. Friends out. Chirac boy number one. Oh, yes, absolutely. We're here. TV shows, four TV shows. Yeah, some, some old. Radio Hall of Fame? Correct, yes. And Broadcasting Hall of Fame? Seven Global Spin Awards. Thank you. <laughs> Hot 97. I'm still there. I'm still the big guy in this city. Oh my God. And this is just to name a few flex. Mm -hmm. So when you hear all of this, is it surreal to you? It, it, mm -hmm. Does it take you back to moments in your career where you can put yourself in each and every one of these places? Or are you still looking ahead? Um, I look ahead, but, you know, people who've done it before me is really my inspiration and my, um, you know, if, if, when you talk tunnel and all those things that you listed, even the albums, you know, I, uh, I watched a DJ, his name is Cool DJ Red Alert, and I watched him have a nightclub. I watched him have albums, and I just watched his whole thing. And I watched him play big clubs, I watched him be on the radio, and that's what kind of inspired me, like hit, watching him. Before you go further, some of the people in this room know mm. what they want to do with their lives. Mm. You're saying you sat back and you watched them. Mm. Did you always know you wanted to be a DJ? Mm -mm -mm. I wanted to be um, <laughs> the first thing I ever said to my mother, and she smacked me. Uh, I want to be a cab driver because I love cars and I want to drive cars all day. She said, "If you ever not to not to talk down on cab drivers, but the, with the age I was at, without 
even getting to high school yet and to college, she said, if you ever fucking say that to me again, I'm gonna smack you. You have to go to high school, college, make your decisions after that. So that taught me a lot. And then um, I want to be a chef. I went to Cullen, wait, what's, um, what's over here in Brooklyn? New York Tech, is that it? Is it still over here? Where is it? They call that the City Tech, now I'm that old. We used to call it New York Tech. Okay, City Tech. So they had a cooking class, and I used to go there, I used to come over the bridge, and then I went to the Culinary Institute in Westchester. Um, I was doing an apprenticeship for a popular chef. Well, because I was Af because I am African American. <laughs> Did that change? <laughs> and when I say was, meaning because that was a long time ago, but no disrespect to uh, people of color, but I knew being African American and wanting to be a chef, I wanted to make sure my accolades were a little stronger than the norm. So I was doing the school and the apprenticeship. People back then, you could do one or the other and get 200 grand. Me, I was like, if I do the apprenticeship and I do the school, when I sit for a job, if you turn me down, it's gonna be because of my color, bro. Because I got both things and you only looking for one. There you go. So um, I was finishing that and um, I, 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 you know, I'm gonna give up my age a little bit. You know, Google's here, so you know all that. Um, in 1990, I got a job while I was in school spending on WBLS. And Chuck Chillout was the host and I played. Yes, you're fast forwarding. Because this is important mm. to understand the journey. Mm. You didn't go from being an apprentice, in a, in a, in an apprenticeship program and cooking school to jumping on the radio. I did all three. Did you really? I did all three. I was still doing school. I still did the apprenticeship. I did the apprenticeship during the night. I did the night shift. I did the school during the day. And Friday and Saturday, I was on the radio, on the rap show. With Chuck. With Chuck. So at that point, you did know you wanted to be a DJ. Something in you sparked that. Not yet. I, I, because I wanted to be, I was, a, I was in a group. Um, I was in a group back then. I wanted to be Jam Master J. That's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be a tour DJ. I wanted to go on the road and DJ for a group. And I had a group and we were rolling a little bit, a little bit of money. We were getting gigs, Chuck was managing us, but when Chuck got a job, he needed a DJ. I didn't even have enough records to play that long because I was a, I spun for rappers. I wasn't really in the clubs. Mm -hmm. So I got my weight up with the records because that's what I needed. And the labels were giving me free records at the time, so I was able to get my weight up. Mm -hmm. And then um, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't know what was going to be that, though. I, I was still cooking because I was still that. To be honest, keep it a thousand, I was a roadie. I, I was Chuck's driver, get the McDonald's, um, the liquor. They want to get high. I got, that was my job because I was the one who didn't drink or smoke. So. I could drive into these neighborhoods, mm -hmm. take this to get what they got to get. I just happened to be a DJ. So, and I used to drive him to the radio station. I was the driver, that was my, I was a roadie first. Then, in being a roadie, when he got a job as an air personality and they needed a DJ, God I just you. happened to be standing there when he got the offer. Well, we can use him. He can play the music. And they used to, they, and then that, that's how that started. So even before Red came into your life, it was Chuck. Chuck was in my life first. Bring Red into the picture. Um, I got fired from WBLS in 91. They fired me for Kid Capri, Ed Lover and Dr. Dre, and someone else. They told me I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing made me work harder than getting fired. 
I remember the programmer's name to this day. His name was Mike Love. I remember Mike. Yeah. I remember Mike. He said, Flex just ain't really cutting it. I respected it though. I didn't blow up, I didn't get angry. I said, I'm gonna get every fucking club in this city. I'm gonna show niggas what I'm made of. You're not gonna fire me again. So, can we stop here for mm -hmm. a second? See my energy, see my energy's changing. Right. See my whole shit is changing now. <laughs> I'm, gonna read, I'm gonna dial it back in, guys. No, 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 stay where you at. <laughs> but there's so many gems and so many lessons to be learned. Mm -hmm. Number one, long before you ever made it to radio, let's dissect this. Mm -hmm. You're cooking, you're doing four and five jobs, you're working as a roadie. Mm -hmm. Your humility. Mm -hmm. Your humility is is at an all time high. It didn't matter. I gotta be honest. I loved it. Yeah, <laughs> I love. I love. I always talk that shit about the highway and the West Side Highway, and I always talk that shit about cars because when I was young, Chuck and, and Red Alert, they loved that West Side Highway, and I used to drive them to work. So I used to pick them up, see them get their sneakers from the sneaker spot. They get their jeans. They get their bread. We'd run downtown, they fresh to death, big jewelry on, 80 niggas in front of the station waiting for them. I was like, this is popping down here. Like, I liked that energy. And then watching them set the turntables up and the, lump, and the light come on and they rocking. But then when I leave, because I would never stay there all night. But then when I leave and I go like to a Whitestone Theater, that's before y'all time, and places like that, and then hear them coming out the car. But I knew what the studio looked like. I knew what they was dressed with that day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when they pop and they slang about, we went to that restaurant, we went to that store. And to watch them walk into like a sneaker store and people mobbing them was amazing to me. Like just that, and like what they did with that turntable was making, bringing passion out of people. So I love that. And that's when I knew I still didn't want to be a radio DJ yet because just that y'all understand, you know, when I was a kid, being, being a radio DJ in the community or in the industry was considered corny. Jam Master J, Grandmaster Flash, Kid Capri, all those guys were the like, the big guys. And they were, a radio DJ didn't get respect. You was a radio, these are like radio niggas. And in doing so, and keeping it a thousand, BLS and KISS at the time were the big stations. And I'm gonna tell you something why I'm such a dick. Cause let me keep it a thousand. I'm a dick on that radio. I'm gonna can, tell we get you. To that? can we get to that? Or, or well, is that I'm gonna go back now. Okay. I'm gonna go back. The reason why I'm saying that is because KISS FM at the time thought I wasn't cool enough and my voice was squeaky. No problem. I'm good with that. BLS, I wasn't bougie enough and I wasn't I wasn't in the know. I, I wasn't the, the guy that was considered cool to hang out with. So Red Alert, Clark Kent, Kid Capri, I can name Jazzy Joyce, they was running the land. Nobody wanted to work at Hot 97. Everybody turned the fucking job down. I made a tape. This is why I'm, I am the way I am about certain things. When, 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 when Hot 97 wanted a tape for the rap show, I was playing in a club home base. Now, I remind you, this is when I'm on my tear because I just got fired. I'm in this club called Home Base. No liquor, no alcohol. So it's even harder to get the crowd in. I'm playing with Onyx, Naughty by Nature, Red Man, everything that matters. I'm in there on the first night. I'm smashing the night, 2000 deep. And it's the urban night, which back then they called the black night. Um, on the second night, it's a Hispanic night where Hot 97 advertises. Um, John Gungi Rivera, I wanna remember these names right. Um, there was another big DJ at the time, um, uh, Little Louis Vega, and a couple other DJs, they walked out on the night. They didn't want it. Promoter said, let's use Flex. 
Now this club I'm talking about, home base, was the club of the time. Red Alert was the one who got me in the club because they called him first and they said, that's my man, you should use my man right there. So he gave me the alley-oop and when I got in there, I did my thing. Now my name's being advertised on Hot 97, I'm not on yet. I'm on my tear because I got fired. I don't care what radio station's gonna hire me. The people who made a tape, Stretch and Barbito, Dr. Dre and Ed Lover, a guy named Andy Panda, and I made a tape. My tape had no talking. I tell you the song, I played Vanilla Ice, I played Hammer, I played OPP on a the tape, they gave me the job. They thought that's what I was gonna play every night. <laughs> When I got in the building, I started ringing off Eric B for president, top billing, red man. They said to me, that's not the tape you made for the show. I said, doggy, I got this. We're going to be, let me get this. I got the street. Let me do what I do. Nobody wanted to work at the station. They used to, the promoters, the record promoters, all the black promoters stopped hiring me. They said, you're a sellout, you over at the pop station, the clubs don't want you no more. We good, nobody would hire me. Hence comes the tunnel. I said, cool, nobody. Slow down. All right, being a dick? You, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're moving quick. Wait, sorry. There's I want to get back to nobody want to come over there. Yes, <laughs> because important, but it's important for me to, because this is important. By the time you made it to radio, to a station that would take you, mm -hmm. number one, the station wasn't hot. Mm -mm. They, they was a dud, they was laughing at me. My first appearance that I went to, my first appearance I went to, there was five dudes there. They wasn't even there for me. It was Lower East Side, shit was empty, 90 degrees. <laughs> there was a, Angie Martinez and Big Dennis were in the back. They were the only ones who kept it 100 with me. I said, yo, does anybody got me on in the street? They were like, no, nigga, you're not on. <laughs> cool, we gonna keep grinding. Let's keep grinding. Then, I remember Angie started work with me and I played a top billing. She said, that's what they wanna hear, stay right there. I said, no problem. She was in the vans. I said, they listening to me yet? No, they not. <laughs> cool, we gonna keep grinding. Kiss and BLS had an in-store where everybody's van showed up. I said, we're going to get there early. We're going to put our banners up. We're going to block the door. So whoever come down here, it's us. They came. We was like, nah, you got to put your banners up out in the street. Nah, y'all can't park the van and we keeping our shit here. It was like, I don't know, 500 people. We started, we started catching momentum. We started catching uh, a movement. So... You know, for me, when I hear people, oh, I deserve to be on. Why ain't I on? Because you ain't putting no fucking time like the time I fucking put in. I was here when nobody was listening. Like, and I understood it's about the people. It's not about you or what you, what you want to get. It's about pleasing the people. So I, I knew at the time, Hot 97 was, um, Hispanic, it was, um, it was Hispanic kids, it was white kids, it was 15% black. I remember the day they told me. And I knew that, and if there's anybody who's trying to be entertainment, I knew to those kids, they didn't have a hero. The African American kids had their hero. Red Alert was their hero. Kid Capri was their hero. They had their heroes, Ron G, they was their heroes. I said, I'm gonna make this work where nobody's thinking, nobody wanna be. But I also knew if I play them street records and I play the things that the hood like, they slowly gonna come fuck with me. And slowly they did. And I used to say the name, I was the first one to say the names on the record. When I first went to an appearance when it was a club, and I don't remember the name, it was like sprats on the water. It was like 2,000 deep. When I walk in, it was like, yo, we thought you were Boricua. <laughs> I was like, nah, I'm, I'm black, bro. Let's get to what we get to in here tonight. But because they never saw me, that audience had never saw me, but 
Meaning, everybody always want what everybody else has. That's easy. And you may not get that. I made my own lane, my own audience, and then slowly but surely, as I make my audience, everybody wanna come. Now, you can come here, we ain't gonna get my slot though, because I know I'm holding it down out here. But, like, that's what, I don't wanna say like that's a, a, a bad thing, but there's always an avenue to make your way. You don't need what the next man has. What that person has is working for them. And I was never upset at those guys. They were hot. Like these dudes was hot. I'm gonna tell you something. I saw Kid Capri when I was a kid. We the same age, but he was hot before me. And I, I remember, cause I'm a person who studies DJs. He was playing in I don't, I don't even know if they did this or not. Do they do this anymore in high school? Do they, do they have assembly in high school anymore? Yes. They still do, right? All right, let, let me give you the play. This dude used to be playing for the assemblies in high school. No DJ want to play those. And the assembly was jammed, the energy's rocking. He'd come out and do 20. My men's were saying, nah, there was no cell phone there, keep it a thousand. I was picking up the phone. <laughs> Yo, your man Capri's here tearing this shit down. I said, where? It's the assembly at school. He's at my school. I was like, fuck out of here. And then I'm told, I'll be honest, I told veteran DJs, I said, yo, bro, this guy right here, he said, he's at the assemblies. And they were probably paying him nothing. But he knew there was an audience of young kids that were there. I'm going to go make my own audience. And that's what I learned from him. I learned different things from Red Alert. And when you spoke about the tunnel, and, and I don't, I want to like, I want to position this where I'm gonna say, you know, cer certain ethnic groups of people sometimes do the crabs in the barrel thing, and I don't understand that. I just don't. I don't come from that, but I know people for some reason like to rip the next man down, or because it's something that they're doing. And I watched when Kid Capri was at his height. I was at home base. I wasn't big yet. I was just kind of on the weekend. And I watched seven, eight promoters. And, and this story would be, would be so much important for whatever you're trying to do. I watched seven, eight party promoters say, Capri think you all that. We not going to book him no more. That was the only reason. He was still packing the spot. He was still doing what he does. He still put in his work. He was still giving those bozos a discount. Is this before Def Comedy Jam? Oh yeah, it's before Def Jam Comedy. This is when he was like, just killing the street. Just killing the street. So, they said they weren't gonna book him. That was their reason. I was in that room. And one of them came over to me, you on kid. We gonna, you about to get a lot of work. I looked at him, I was like, snake nigga, but I know what to do. From that day on, I said, I'm gonna create my own nightclub, I'm gonna get a club. I didn't know what the name was gonna be, I'm gonna get my own, I'm gonna put the promoters in, they gonna work for me. So, never heard this before. Mm -hmm. So this is the birth, the inception of the tunnel? It was, it was the reason why I, I was gonna get a club. It's the reason why I became the promoter instead of just the DJ. Because when I saw that meeting, it hurt him because they was controlling the hot parties at the time. So if they not putting him in front of the people he needs to see, because I could be playing in a club that night, but those kids wanted to see him. If they had a first choice, but if you don't, if you ain't, if, you, if all you guys make a decision that you ain't gonna use this guy, that's the first time I witnessed hate the music industry and how people roll. And I laughed with them, but I understood, I'ma dead these niggas, I can't wait. And I, from that point I said, I'm gonna figure out how to become a promoter. And there was this DJ, his name, and I wanna remember his name, cause he's a great guy to Google, Junior Vasquez. He was a, still is, he was a big house DJ. And he told me, you need to start becoming the promoter because we were playing in the same rooms. 
he would have Saturday night and it was his night that he was like, I, I'm not saying get more money because it's not about the money. It's not about the money, it's about the control because I made just as much as the promoter would pay me, but the promoter can't kick me out the club no more. So what it was is Junior Vasquez taught me he had Saturday night, I had Sunday night at clubs, or I'd have the Friday. And he was the promoter hiring the sub-promoters, but you didn't really need a sub-promoter back then, and he was making the money. He was making his money, was paying everybody out. I did the same. I said, he taught me that, I went to the club, I started to say, all right, I'm gonna play the club. I gotta bring in my team. I'm gonna bring in this. And I don't mind sharing the numbers now. So the tunnel, was giving me 10 grand a week. I, I would take a little bit. Was that the most money you was making at the time? Well, that era? Well, there was something included in the 10, though. Okay, go ahead. The 10 was for me to promote, hand out, well, well promote, hand out flyers, and, and, and something else. I took that money, I opened the office, I got a staff. They just wanted me to work for the club. So the money they was paying me, I used to open my office, get a staff, then we started getting five, six clubs right. off that one bread. We just spending all that money on these clubs. We're gonna get the, keep it a thousand, like the drug game, because that's what they be doing. Right. So I was like, this is what I'm gonna do. And then the wheels started to click. I was like, you know, then I gotta uh, take it further because Red Alert, to be legendary in New York, you got to master a club. And Red Alert had the Roxy, Union Square, and Latin Quarter. His, his, his legacy was solidified in New York. And if I didn't get a club, I knew my legacy wasn't going to mean nothing in New York City. You know, every, every DJ that was big had a club. So I hope I fast forward too much, but I'm sorry. I'm just giving you my... Just reel it back in. Yeah. Because you just... But it's great information. Mm -hmm. Where's Hot 97 in this picture? You get more time, Hot 97 starting to go? I was making $50 a week, not complaining. $50 a week on radio, mm -hmm. $10,000 a week. The well, club. the tunnel didn't come yet. The tunnel didn't come. Oh, no, no, no. That tunnel's when, when I got the city open, <laughs> the tunnel comes. But now, at this point- How many I, days a week at Hot? Hot 97, I still got a day job. Yeah, I'm still working in the day. I'm still, you know, doing what I'm doing, living at home with my mom. Still. Twisted. Yeah, I'm, I'm still home. I got the job and they gave me 50 hours a week. So I'm on every Friday night, 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. They gave me a slot that had failed 10 times before. Damn. I was part, they already told me. That never worked. The salespeople didn't even look at me because they didn't feel they were gonna be looking at me long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they ain't talk to me, they ain't shake my hand. I overheard a salesperson walk by me in the studio and say, that shit is never gonna work. Never forget that. How does it go from two to four, one night a week? No, oh, it, it was grind before that. It went from two to four to midnight to two. How many nights in the club now? Cause I'm, I'm still a man, I'm, like I'm doing six, seven nights in the club. Heavy. Well, you know how New York City used to work is, if you, whenever you became the club king, you got a job. And you've witnessed it, Clue, club king got a job. You know, he's doing the club's tapes. Self. DJ Self, club king, gets a job. You know, it kind of still works like that if you can command all the clubs. So I was the guy of the moment that year when they were looking for 93, 94, I was the man of the moment. So I got that, that chance, mm -hmm. right? So we're one night, 12 o'clock, there's a club, and this, is what I'm, this, this goes back to, um, a lot of people think opportunity is attached to a dollar. If anybody tells you that they're lying to you, that's not the way nothing works. From 12 to two, the owner of the tunnel, before I even met him, 
He had a club called the Palladium. Is that where NYU is at now? Yep. So are you guys familiar with NYU in, in City, 14th Street? That was a club, Palladium, held 3,000 people. That club had a Friday night, they're doing 3,000, ringing. I go to them, I say, hey, can I play here? They said, you'll never play here. You used to play at that club home base. You're not bringing that nasty crowd into our club. I had the sales guy call him, call her, the lady, mm -hmm. who I became very good friends with, she's very nice, but at the time, they told me no. They didn't even ask how much I wanted. The salesperson, I said, tell him I'll come for free. They said, tell him he could come down. I said, what time can I play? <laughs> tell him 3.15. Nigga, the club's over for. <laughs> no problem, give me that 3.15 slot. Okay, you want action? I'm gonna give you action tonight. I, I remember the records to this day. I played 900 number, Wu-Tang, Protect Your Neck. I played uh, Run DMC, Peter Piper, lifted that motherfucker off the ground. Place going nuts. The lady's not even being nice to me. They don't even offer me nothing to drink. I'm here for free. So they don't thank me nothing. I go back to work. I call the, the sales guy. Yo, you think? She said, tell him he could come down here again if he wants for free. We might start paying him in a month. What time can he get on? Three. No problem. I'm going to take this three. Killing him again. I'm killing him for two months. Mind you, the name of the night is called Hex's House. The guy Hex Hector was the biggest remixer at the time. Uh, anybody familiar with CNC Music Factory? Yeah. Yeah. Like this is, they were a very big group. One guy died, yeah. um, but it was a huge group. So the guy who did the mixes and he was the DJ for them, it was his house. He's packing it. His name was across the, the, the big, what is that? The marquee, <laughs> big on the marquee. They didn't even mention me. I started oh, going on at three. Come on, they? Exactly. Okay. You start ringing this off. You think you could come in two? No problem. How much you want to pay him? Two fifty. No problem. I'm gonna come down here. I came down at two fifty. You think he can come at one? The kids want to see him earlier. No doubt. But we're gonna change the front of that marquee. We're gonna do things a little different. What y'all thinking? No problem. They got rid of him the next week. But I earned it. I had to show that you can see. I'm gonna tell you something about life. People always bank on you want the money. So if you want the money, they go, just don't give him the money. He'll never get the opportunity to even get up against me. Nah, I'll come down here for free. What y'all thinking? If I'm Mike, send me on. No problem. But, but even to get to that point, now, this is how life works. This guy owns the tunnel, but I'm only playing on Fridays. And I think Angie starts hosting it. The guy who owns the Palladium owns the tunnel. The guy who owns the tunnel, the guy who owned Palladium owned the tunnel. He owned this club called USA, and he owned the Coco and Limelight. I don't know all of this, none of this, when I come in the building. That's not Peter Gage. It's Peter Gage. Okay. So he keeps saying, you know, Sunday, it was, see, on Sunday night in New York City, first of all, uh, is, is everybody in here 25 and under? 25 and under or, or, or over? Everybody's 25 and under. Okay, so then you see how you can, you guys now, today, you can go party anywhere you want to party. You can party in Manhattan um, in the city on a weekend. So in the 90s and early 2000s, there was no African-American party in Manhattan, only the boroughs. There was no party. So the, I knew if I, no matter what night I got, if it was a Tuesday, a Monday, it's gonna work because the kids haven't been coming downtown. So he, it, Sunday night was um, uh, a gay night in New York at every club. Every club had a gay night, no matter what club it was, and it was packed, it was big. 
There was a drug at the time. Ecstasy. Ecstasy. Exactly. Who said that? <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> yeah. At the time it was ecstasy. So you dr you sold a lot of water when you drove with, with ecstasy because you needed water for the drug to work. So at the game nights you charged them and everything. So I understood what that mathematics was. I kept telling them, fam, them kids would buy a lot of champagne in there, man. Do the math. I get the same people amount in there. But them champagne bottles and water bottles is a different price. He kept thinking about it. He kept thinking about it. And every time he'd be like, I had a bad weekend, you think? Because Jessica Rosenblum, I had a manager that was uh, key, and she was very good at what she did. And she would relay the information. Finally, he just said, I'm going to try it. And it worked because I knew champagne is going to cost more than the water. He's going to make bread in here. Now, the tunnel kicked me out once. Them and my manager, I had to make a decision. Them and my manager had an argument. It was about the money. Now, this is, I'm going to explain to you such an important <coughs> part of business. The first half of my tunnel career, we were getting a, a portion of the door. So the owner wanted to get rid of us, do the night on his own. No, who said why? Well, no, don't worry about that. You know why? It's good when people show you who they are early. Cool. Let me see who you are. No problem. You love money? I was like, okay. We took some time off. He's begging to come back. But him and my manager's not getting along. No problem. I love her, but I overrode her. I took the night. He said, well, how are we going to do this deal? How are we going to do it different? I'm going to take a flat fee. You could keep the rest. I did that for a reason. Because now, this guy used to be at the door. Oh, they can't come in. Don't put them in. Shut the door. Right? Now, he getting the whole door? Everybody come in. What you shutting the door for? Now, he's making it a movie. Now, he wants everybody to come in. And I'm like, then if I had 800 people, now I got 1,200. And he wants to get everybody in. No problem. And he's keeping that door. I'm going to get this flat fee because I'm getting a call from every club in the fucking city to work, nigga. That's how I looked at him. That's what I'm going to do. Because, see, he's operating off greed. I'm operating off something different. I'm, off, I'm operating off access. Because you cannot be in the game if they don't allow you at the table. If you always remember that, you ain't gonna be in the game if they don't allow you at the table. You gotta get to the table. And that's what I always looked at, even to this day. You're not gonna not let me get to the table. I want, I'm, I want at the table. And when I get to the table, if I'm not as good, cool, kick me away from the table. But, you know, if I hold up, man, what y'all got for me? Tunnel legendary. There's no question. Legendary in this city. How does your multi nights on the radio come about? Hmm. Um, because that's a game. Now I remember a lot of guys ain't been able to play that game. Um, <laughs> no, really. No, I never really played that game. Um, I want to say. I was on Friday night. Now, to paint the picture at the time, even though I'm on Hot 97, I'm not the biggest DJ in the city. Correct. I'm kind of, you know, what would you call it? I'm a contender at the time. This is nice. You know, I had potential. And that's, there was like 10 of us who had potential at the time. And but you had the tunnel. I didn't have the tunnel yet, yet, but I had a- was a different movie. The tunnel, the tunnel was when I was established, but you know, uh, Red Alert, see, does everybody really have an understanding what an internship is in here? Yeah. Uh, what's an internship? 
working for somebody to to learn for free, pretty much just get knowledge, and experience. Yeah. It, but does everyone look at it like that? I look at it like that. Like an and and you're correct. You guys are correct. I'm gonna tell you the step before the internship. Now, do you think people give you an internship because they want free labor? Yes. Uh, who said yeah? Okay, you think that it's because of free labor? Why do you think that? Because there's been times that I've been at internships where I overheard them say, like, we're going to keep them because at the end of the day, we don't have to pay for them, so why not keep them here because they're helping us for free? You're correct, too. That's how people look at it. <laughs> and there's some people who look at it like you, you guys look at it. I'm going to take you to where the opportunity comes before all of that. A person with knowledge and access is the most important person in the fucking room. You know why? Because if you can get to see, it's not just about being where he is and operating, it's about being where he is and seeing how he handles the situation. And those were the things that were priceless to me. It's the only reason I'm still out here at the top of my game is because Chuck, chill out, and Red Alert let me be a fly on the wall. They let me see their triumphs, and they let me see their mistakes. And I was able to take that in and say, well, I'm going to do that different, but I'm going to do that how they did it. And, I, and it, being allowed to ask them questions, because they allowed me to ask them and get their opinion. Let me tell you about a, 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 a DJ. If you're in a club or in the radio, there's no money in the business that I am until you become an air personality. If you're just a mixer, you're never gonna great, break the bank. And when I was just a mixer, Red Alert, he never told me don't take no money to play records, but I watched him not take money for records. And I watched, I watched the music industry always be annoyed with him. Oh, you know Red. Red what? I ain't playing my shit, man. Really? But I knew that's because they can't pay him. And when somebody can't buy your, uh, your opinion and your integrity, right, it's valuable later on. And he explained to me, because I used to ask him questions. How did you make money when you were making no money, but you're this powerful guy on the radio? I would play the clubs. What you mean? I play the clubs, make my money at the end of the night so I could pay my rent, get my weight up until the radio station would give me good money. Got it. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I'm going to get this bread in the club. And after a while, when a label would call me the record I didn't like, I'd say, well, I don't like it. What the fuck you mean you don't like it? Fuck you. I don't like it. Because you don't pay me. You don't give me no money on the side. So, hold on, we're about to go somewhere. Oh, payola? No, 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 oh, no, not at all. We know, we know you. I'm alive. You can talk about it. No, no. <laughs> Flex. It's no secret. Mm -hmm. To a lot of people, you're a good dude. Put to a lot more, you're a dick. Piece of shit. Yes, you are. <laughs> Absolutely. You're a dick. We're clear? I, and I am. Okay. Does that mentality come from the idea that you cannot be controlled because I've watched you do things that people would not dare do right what dare do you have gone up against some of the most powerful people in the industry but we're going to back it up mm -hmm. Namor? John Namor? Namor? Not, 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 not now we're going to get there in terms, of your, in terms of labels, pushing records on, we all did. Your ability to say no, did you find, you know what, this for me is empowering. I, I, watch, I watch Red Alert do it. I'm gonna tell you something. 
I watched a friend of mine that I love dearly to this day. And, and I watch labels and record companies give him money. And I used to pick up that money for him. And I used to watch the labels when I come in the door. I wouldn't even flex it. I was fucking, my name was Junior. When they call me George. Ah, oh, hey, hey. Boom, boom, boom. Right? And I, and I give it to my man. When he got fired, I just happened to call one of these dudes. I didn't even think he knew my man got fired. I just called him and it was like, Yo, bro, I'm downstairs. I want to pick up some records. He had me come up. He said, tell your man he's an ordinary motherfucker now. And I was like, whoa. Because I thought these people were friends. I thought the music industry and people were friends. I thought this is like I come from the cooking business where everybody's hunky-dory. Let's cook these corn muffins. <laughs> and now this man is talking to me nuts. But it wasn't nuts. Because what I realized from that conversation was you never liked paying that money. And you never liked being squoles, but you did it because you wanted, you wanted to get your record played. And I used him as a blueprint of that's the way y'all motherfuckers think. Now, because I was a bad man at one time and I went and gave the money and the drugs to niggas, right? Now, when I get on the radio, but mind you, I'm never thinking I'm ever going to get on the radio because I want to be a rap DJ in the clubs. So then when I get on the radio, those same guys come around. Yo, what up? <laughs> Fuck's up. Yo, you know, like how we used to do before? No. No, what you mean no, nigga? I was like, no. You know, that's the way he was running his shit. So now from the door, the music industry hated my guts from the door, but then I kept that going. Let me tell you something, I'm gonna do the math and Red Alert taught me the math. You wanna give me five grand to play a record? I hear you. Let's take it back then, two grand. If I get hot in this club, I can get four grand. So I was like, I put more time into getting hot because then if I'm hot and I'm getting bread, I don't need to take your money. So then I knew if I, I got, my goal was, yeah, I'm on this radio, but I got to get hot in the clubs and the streets because I got to, here, you see how the grand people like the front, right? This is everybody's problem. If anybody in here, if you're unemployed, but you walk outside with a Louis bag, people think you got bread, right? So if I walk outside and I'm on this big radio station, people think I got bread. I don't, I'm making $50 a night. I had to, if I didn't get hot in the club, I would have to take the label money. Cause it's, it, it, it's no, I'm not gonna be able to balance this. I'm spending, I gotta keep my gear up in the club. I gotta get a watch. I gotta get a new car. I can't pull up in the ocean I was driving. Like this is nuts. I gotta get this, I gotta get this going. And, and Red Alert taught me, get that going and you ain't never gotta, nobody's ever gonna talk to you funny. And that was probably, that, that's why I go back to internship. The, the best thing you could do of someone you admire is for that person to allow you to be a fly on that wall and see how stuff interact. Because it ain't about just the job. Because if you get the job, but you didn't learn how it, it moved, you may get your check, but you ain't moving up. I wanted to move up. So that's, that was, key for me in getting from, I was able to sustain my pocket until I got another night. And I always remember people who helped me or give me good information. And there was a program director by the name of Steve Smith. And he told me, if you, if you stay in your, in your, and you just be a DJ, your career is going to be limited. And eventually your, your career is going to end. He said, if you become a, a air personality, you know, there's a difference between the, you know, just that you know, understand in, in radio, like the, when you talk on the mic is different from when you just mix. Some people mix and talk when they're mixing, but they're not an air personality. So that's like, 
an hourly salary, a wage, and then there's a, a what you, what, what's the other shit? When you get a salary, like on a, salary. Or on salary or an hourly. Yeah. People who mix get an hourly. People who are on, so he was telling me you have to get to that to get the right money and to get where you need to go. And in the beginning, kids didn't like me on when R&B was playing or slow jams. They was like, what the fuck? You know, you're usually on at night throwing on Wu-Tang. And I had to get accustomed to it. And they taught me. It was like, you can't sound so abrasive over those records. You got to sound, bring your tone down. And you got to kind of this. And, you know, they, they, they taught me and I learned, you know, Wendy Williams was a, a, a big inspiration for me. Um, uh, Jeff Fox, um, Frankie Crocker, uh, people like that. I was, a, I was a really huge fan of Wendy. Wendy used to do this thing, the Top 8 at 8. She's kind of who I got that talking shit from. But Wendy, Wendy and me got that talking shit from a guy named Mr. Magic who used to be on in the 80s. And he was talk shit, yeah, like, and Google him one day and it probably won't even give you what you need to know, but Mr. Magic was the first guy, at the end of his show, he used to do this long speech and he'd say, yeah, boys and girls, blah, 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 blah. Or you might find yourself by yourself, just as, and he would say a rapper's name. And one time the nigga said Eric B. And I was like, oh shit, he said Eric B. Because Eric B was the toughest nigga in the land. Gun toting, street nigga. I was like, oh my God, the nigga just said Eric B. This is so crazy. <laughs> but that, that thing, it resonated with me. Like, oh shit, he's, he's talking street shit. He was the first guy to say the boroughs. He was the first guy to say money making Manhattan, boogie down Bronx. Uh, just, uh, uh, he would just give the, the burrows that feel. And his voice was so clear and, and um, polished. And he was the person, you know, I know you listen to two stations in New York now, but Mr. Magic was the one who polished this enough for us to be here and make money. And he passed away. And he didn't pass away with the accolades he should have. But that's all to say, you know, we got our style from him and those are guys that I looked up to. I want to fast forward just to move things on, right? <clears throat> You're on the radio. Mm. Got your slot. We're going to get back to the big guys that I went up with, right? And don't yes, do we are. <laughs> <laughs> because it's important. It's important, right? Yeah, yeah. I want to, we can cap off with that. Let's go somewhere a good place. Hold on, let's do Where'd the bomb come from? Um, and why the bomb? If you'll notice, I say names of people who associate with something, of people who helped me along the way. Because mm -hmm. I can't stand motherfuckers who don't say the people who helped them or when they stumble into something. But uh, a guy, Chris McCardo, gave me like 40 sound effects. And I said, I need a new sound effect. And we were playing different ones every night. But this guy named Mike Kaiser, who works at Atlantic Records, at the time he worked at Def Jam, and he said, oh, you got the city on fire. I'm like, yeah, thanks. And he was talking, and he just said, he, he kept holding me up on the phone. He said, yeah, but that bomb sound effect. I said, you like it? He said, yeah, like that. But other people use the bomb. But this goes back to when I talked about people taking money and, 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 and letting people pay them. I made that bomb mean when I like something. And that's what I want to get I chose to. that bomb. Yeah. I said I wanted a sound effect that represented when I liked something. So and it was intentional. It was intentional to find a sound effect for it. But when did it, when did it turn to mean, because that bomb is synonymous with Funk Flex, with Flavor in your ear, heat. Craig Mac, uh, 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 what's the other one? Get at me, dog. DMX. Uh, what's the mother, what's the other records? The Benjamins. When did you say I want this bomb to mean something? It wasn't. And then I was talking shit. I wanted and I hit it. 
I was talking shit, and, I, and it was a song, and I remember, and I was like, I put, it really buys me time. So I go, and it gives me time to think. And then I talk again, and I hit it again. So if you notice, there's always a pause. I know I'm giving up my secrets, I don't care. But that's what I do, so, but I only did that over new songs. And people used to come and say, how much did the bomb cost? I love that, because that meant it don't cost nothing, nigga, and you can't buy it, but I know you want it. <laughs> so that's plenty for me. And then I, I just, it was important for me to like, uh, it gave me a sound. It gave me a, it gave me a sound. It gave me a, it, it expressed my feelings without me saying I like this. Okay, tell me something else. You remember the first, because it's thousands of records. Mm. Funk Flex drop a bomb on it. Who's the first? Mm. Who was the first? And you talked about and a lot of stuff, out. but when did you know I arrived? When did you know I mean so much? Nobody's gonna know this song, but I'm gonna tell you a song. What's the uh I gotta remember these guys' names because it's so important that This is the first? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is my first shout out on the record. Go ahead. Gotta be 91. Don't worry about how old. 91. The name of the group is JVC Force. From Ireland. Absolutely. That's where you're from? London. Okay, okay. All right. So JVC Force. Yeah. And they said, Red Alert rocks the house Santa. From Master Flex, rock. I was like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, well, to, to take you to, to Red Alert, I used to fill in for him when he went out of town. That's how I really got my break break. So, him helping me and everything was act I was filling in for him. So, you, you guys are familiar with ESPN, Stephen A. Smith? Yeah. I want to give you the comparison. Imagine a motherfucker called you and said, look, you're going to be in for Stephen A. Smith tonight. Yeah. And you're going to just be the only motherfucker. Like, that was it. He was, he, he was the like everything, like he came out of cars, it was everything. And he would go away three times a year. So I would fill in. So in filling in, or other shit, they were really shouting me because I used to be on BLS. So the record had, records used to take so long to come out then. Mm -hmm. It just so happened I landed someplace by the time the song came out. So that was probably, and still is, my most important shout because they were just the first to kind of just, and it was a record that was playing in the club. But I, I understood, we didn't call it hate back then, we understood it was called jealousy. But I understood when the DJ's bigger than me wouldn't play my part in the record. I was like, ooh, you piece of shit. I get it now. And I never did that though. I always played these, but I start to understand, oh, you scared of me? No problem, get ready to be real scared. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.